And my name is Alex Matrosov, and I will be presenting today the Advanced Threats Evolution Researchers Arm Race. Uh, this talk's actually been uh, developed as a keynote for Ofzen and Ecopathy, and it's a bit more high level than talks I usually presented. Usually I try to take one big problem and dig into it and find a lot of smaller problems in one. Here is a talk of problems, I would say, this one. And I think it's really right audience to address this problem and maybe became with a solution. So I'm chief offensive security researcher with NVIDIA and I did a lot of firmware security research and advanced malware analysis in the past. And actually I'm doing reverse engineering and security research from 1997. How became the idea of this talk and uh, what actually uh, I try to uh, make a message here. And I think evolution of persistent technique, it's very interesting. And if you look uh, on this picture, it's iceberg. And I would say we have security industry visibility point and modern persistent techniques, which is not visible and it's persist for years. And I think the first talks raised great questions and the first talks was covering uh, antivirus industry problems. They can see some of the threats, which is have a deals with the firmware, but they don't know what to do with the new ones because they use approaches which they actually apply on the operating system level and they don't use specified methods for the firmware. And Rob actually highlighted complexity of development process especially on the security side for the hardware. And it's very complex. And it's a lot of places where it can be go wrong. Let's talk about evolution of the persistent technique. And I would say every time when we develop in mitigations against the malware persistent, it's raising the bar of complexity. But the bar always only on the most common ones. So basically when it was antivirus industry was catching the first rootkits. They became with a solution of host intrusion prevention systems and anti-rootkits. But these methods of mitigations, the problems, was not catching the bootkits when it just became feasible on the threats landscape. <laughs> so I developed this picture to show how basically new, new mitigation raise the bar and the attackers became with a new solution for bypassing this mitigation and go down and down to the stack closer to the hardware. So on the operating system, when actually Microsoft uh, makes Secure Boot mainstream and code signing policy, it's basically a move from um, attack surface rootkits and bootkits but now we have a deals with the bias implants and not only now, in the past too, but not a lot of solutions can see that. And I would say it's clearly zero. So what kind of types of persistence we have? We can persist in the hardware, in the firmware, in the boot process, with the bootloaders, in the file system and operating system kernel, in the memory and other places. So mostly, security solutions, which we have right now, it's covering the operating system level and the boot process, and the firmware and hardware, it's such as the blind spot for the persistence. And somebody can argue and say, we have some of the methods in modern antiviruses to scan the firmware. Yes, but it's mostly about the integrity, not such as deep analysis and understanding the threat. So, I was writing this book, and it's not about the book, it's about the cover, this slide, and actually on the cover, we have the Kraken, and this guy, a little guy on the board, it's a malware analyst actually, escaping from the advanced persistent threat, because in many cases, really, when you see the first time a really complex threat, you don't know how to analyze it, and you start learning new stuff, and you start basically developing some of the solutions, automation and detection methods and mitigations for this threat. And only after that, you probably know how to make a deal with the Kraken. So 
Um, golden age of uh, boot kits and root kits, it was from like 2006 and 2012, it was a lot of root kits and uh, Main motivation actually for these cybercrime groups was a persist in the system for DDoS and spam because such of the bots, it's, if you have many, your botnet, it's more powerful to do this stuff, some stuff. But let's think about state-sponsored actors and persistence motivation for them. It's very different and espionage, uh, gathering data, attack specific target uh, in specific time. So it's a lot of motivational things which is doesn't clear actually for, for uh, cyber crime actors and very different. And actually specifically for that, the firmware is perfect because nobody can see it, nobody can detect it, and it can persist for years. So, but let's switch the focus on golden age of firmware and hardware implants, which is happening right now. This figure actually demonstrates the timeline, kind of like what kind of threats, especially attacking the firmware we have, and we can clearly see how some of the mitigation change the attack surface and make some threats actually more active. And on one side, we have proof of concepts developed by researchers, and many of them actually been developed by Zina and Corey in the past. Um, and actually, um, on the top, we can see the active groups which has been used uh, in plans for the state-sponsored attacks. And we can see it's kind of like really rare we can catch real samples, but a lot of activity from the researchers, it's very feasible, but not all the industry make a right call. Also, in the media, we have a lot of big topics, and uh, Rob mentioned the Bloomberg. Uh, so if everybody talking it's possible, but no clues, actually real clues, how it's possible on specific case, which is Bloomberg mentioned. So, okay, uh, let's talk about the mitigations on the kernel level. So we have a patch guard, code signing, a lot of other stuff, but we don't have actually anything on the firmware, right? So we don't have a lot of mitigations. We have some mitigations which is not against uh, the persistence which is happens in runtime. After uh, we already boot the system, if somebody attacks the SMM and persists just with the, such as the implant in the memory of SMM and doesn't actually raise the persistence inside the firmware or spy flash. So it will be not detected by any runtime checkers uh, or verifications or whatever mechanism we have. And if we think about the servers, they have uptime sometimes for months, sometimes for years. And such as thread into the memory have a really, really long-term persistent time. And we don't have any preventions actually, because on the operating system, we do have a lot of prevention mechanism on uh, BIOS and other firmwares, we don't have any preventions and detections methods. And actually a good call for the firmware and hardware industry, uh, it will be maybe developed kind of like a unified solution to provide some of the telemetry um, for uh, antivirus vendors to basically have some runtime capability to detect such as threats. Of course, it can extend the attack surface too, and it's not an easy question to develop this securely. <laughs> I would highlight uh, some of the solution which is doing that. I would say one of the first ones, it's been uh, Apple who developed the UEFI check. It's kind of like the small uh, piece of software which is collecting and validating the firmware on the common integrity problems. And maybe they doing more when they get to the server, uh, but we don't know. Uh, and it's also interesting because antivirus industry also collecting these dumps. But problem, when you have such dumps, what we can do with it? So the main problem if uh, it's about the methods, how we can analyze it and basically extract kind of like um, malicious patterns from it 
and detect such as threats, right? Even if we have all the dumps from across our organization, we don't know what is inside, we don't know how to analyze it. It is a problem. And integrity, when we just detect and say this model is actually corrupted, it doesn't say nothing because we have just highlighted the problem, but we don't know what the problem are. Um, what the challenges for the point solutions have? So limits of gathering information on the boot process. So we basically can fake everything because if we persist inside the firmware, all boot process upper the stack, it can be fake. No trust path between antivirus and actually UEFI firmware because it's operating on different abstraction level. One in the operating system level, another on the firmware, and it's no connection points and the exchange points of information. And maybe it will be interesting uh, back kind of question to the industry to develop this unified interface and point of connection, but securely. <laughs> So, and of course, uh, blind spot of supply chains make hell of problem, and we don't know how to deal with it yet. Other problem, who watch the watchers, we have like a lot of microarchitectural attacks became mainstream like last few years. We have firmware is everywhere, even in my watch, and BIOS became a foundation of cloud protection, and Sometimes it's broken. Supply chain attacks, it's mainstream, and uh, it's became a mainstream uh, recently, but it was a years known. So such as the tools, very cheap, and you basically can develop kind of hardware implants. It's PCI Screamer from Lambda Concept, uh, cheap Arctic 7 FPGA, redevelop this board. It's actually not that hard. And, um, other one, it's for uh, DMA persistent, so it's very, very interesting stuff. Very cheap, under 200 bucks both. Um, actually, this tweet is very interesting because I think uh, this researcher find a design problem where uh, DMA was possible on early stage of the boot if you have the device on uh, DMA, uh, PCI device on your machine installed. He developed actually FPGA uh, bitstream for reproducing this attack. But main point actually of this slide, this design problem is not fixed yet. It's have such as boundary, synthetic boundary, but architecturally it's not fixed. It's an EDK. Um, other point I want to say, Microsoft doing the right thing, raising more visibility on the platforms which they executing their operating system. Because um, not many vendors is equal, and some of them just don't care about security. And it will be some other slides on my presentation. So, and HSTI, I, so I basically extracted this. I don't know any of these drivers because it's not actually public a lot of information on public available. And um, for me, it was a big surprise about the device guard Dixie. And it's actually have a feedback loop to the operating system level and have a runtime checks for uh, features and de dependencies for enabling some of the security features on the operating system level. But if you think about, if you can compromise some of these components, and fake to operating system, uh, we have all the requirements, but the machine is vulnerable anyway, so it will be help us to run um, operating system full of features and uh, make kind of um, vision for the user, the system is secure, and all the features is enabled, and the firmware is secure, but it is not. Um, some of the vendors like that um, have actually zero protection. Uh, and, you know, 
They don't have security teams, and honestly, they don't care about security. Uh, it's why, because um, some of the vendors like MSI and ASRock, when you send them vulnerabilities, they just don't reply. So what I can do? <laughs> Gigabyte is a bit better, but fixing loop for these vulnerabilities is huge. Other problem, which is I want to highlight it here, it's limitation of the tooling for researchers to basically go and do forensics, go re do reverse engineering, and some, time, some debugging in this, on, on the platform for basically verify in runtime all the capabilities for the specific firmware driver. Brian actually mentioned a good point. You can do on main board, on, on manual board, a lot of research, but problem, manual board doesn't have all the hardware capabilities uh, which you need for your firmware or specific driver. Yes, you can do the straps, but it's create a lot of limits. Full system simulation like CMEX don't provide the hardware vendor specific environment and UEFI protocols, which is create a lot of limitations, right? So UEFI emulations like UEMO, same thing. You have even more limited stuff than CMEX. And for CMEX, you need, if you have the right silicon model, you probably will be good on testing a lot of things there. For this QEMO, uh, you can just stop uh, workflows to fuzz uh, some specific drivers or debug it or verify it. Some, some specific algorithms how it's working. Hardware level debugging like DCI, it's not actually, it's, it's possible on many platforms, especially slide to unlock DCI on it. But it's not really like a clear path how you can get the debugger. As example, if you want to order one, you need to sign NDA with Intel. So if I don't want, as a researcher, sign any NDAs, you can get it, can't get it, or you should go to the shadow, shady markets to basically find it. Or you can try to find it one on AliExpress, but you never know if it's like original one. <laughs> or maybe it's basically will be installed back there in your system. You also never know. Um, some tools for reverse engineering specifically uh, been developed recently, but mostly provide some feasibility on the runtime services on early boot stage, like uh, T-Train, but uh, actually very expensive solution. IDA Pro actually have um, some uh, capabilities, better capabilities for the static analysis. Uh, Hexrays uh, did a lot of good job for basically uh, provide uh, better analysis for Dixie drivers and pay drivers too. So welcome to brave new world. And let's think about how many steps you need to basically uh, write uh, malicious spy flash. So not too much actually. And um, even more um, here, interesting point. We have a BIOS update tools, right? And they supposed to be flashing the firmware, but some of them, uh, like generic tools developed by AMI or Phoenix, they don't care about the validation of the firmware itself, right? It should bias or like some other arbitrary uh, point create some validation flow. So you can reuse such the tools for flashing malicious stuff. And um, actually, it was one of the points of my presentation on Black Hat Asia in 2017 when I developed proof of concept of uh, ransomware and used just legit tools for uh, flash it on uh, spy flash. But we have some of the solutions which is uh, basically being developed for uh, one of them armoring boot process, one of them armoring update process is a boot guard and a BIOS guard. But I would say BIOS guard is a super complex technology as a boot guard, but about BIOS guard, it's even worse. Not a lot of vendors use it. And about the boot guard, a lot of vendors use it, but not correctly. Also, we have a hell of support for large enterprises 
with a boot guard and bias guard when, as example, you can't just go manually for update for 5,000 machines, right? So, and here, programmably, we disable the boot guard on some very known vendor. I will not uh, say the name, and uh, because this vulnerability not patched yet, you know? And uh, I can disable over Active Directory uh, the boot guard. Horrible, right? <laughs> uh, other problem uh, which I want to highlight it, it's unified process for updating the firmware. And we need the solution when the user don't need to go on the website of the vendor and download themselves uh, actually the firmware. And I like the Microsoft actually creates such of the framework for Develop, uh, delivering the firmware in a unified way, but not a lot of vendors actually use it. Other problem actually, Microsoft don't, doesn't require image to be signed. <laughs> so, and uh, on the Linux ecosystem, uh, we have uh, LVFS, which is pretty uh, similar solution, like we have one repository where the vendor submitted their firmware updates and then the user go over unified way to download it. Um, and actually, I also always do in the quiz how many people in the room on my talks update their firmwares. And you know, um, not a lot of hands actually usually raise it because many people, even researchers who work in maybe on upper level stack, they don't think they should care about their firmware themselves nowadays. And it's kind of showing um, how many one-day vulnerabilities can persist for years, right? And uh, actually, how many steps we need to exploit remotely the firmware and deliver the firmware rootkit? And of course, we need some kind of like uh, uh, remote code execution vulnerability in the browser or something, or like malicious Word document, which will be gain um, administration privileges on the machine, or like system privileges, depends on the exploit. And then uh, you need to basically get to the kernel, communicate with such of the services uh, connected to the BIOS, and then you basically can um, attack uh, as example, if, or scan actually, you can scan and attack uh, the BIOS if it's like need to be used zero day, you can, or one day, if it's a persist there, why not, right? And uh, Logix uh, shows a problem because it's used very old vulnerabilities. And um, it was actually detected pretty recently, right? So usually for the attacker, you can go actually to, for the details on my blog post, link is here for, for the, this picture, but usually you need actually six, seven steps. And it's a lot, right? So it's a huge chain of exploits, which is not cheap, of course, because you need uh, remote code execution on the user level. And um, yeah, so I think it's not common uh, scenario for usual, usual cyber crime but if you think about ATMs and such of the systems, which is, has a lot of values for the attacker, so it can be a scenario, right? And um, one more thing, it's SMM runtime problems, because I mentioned it can be just persistent in memory. You don't need to go to the spy flash then. It's why actually golden age of the firmware hardware implants, it's happening right now. And um, firmware was not considered many years as a critical security asset. And it's patchable, right? For the hardware vendors, in many cases, they can say, okay, we need to take care about the problems in silicon and after we can basically fix some problems in the firmware because it's cheap. Right? We just deliver the software update. And cost for the firmware, it's like not comparable with recall of the silicon. 
bring up of the new hardware is very hard actually. And it's when the focus mostly for system to boot and blink the screen, right? Nobody cares about security features working correctly, configured correctly. The screen should blink and boot something, right? And it's specifically when um, on bring up stage, uh, the vendors which doesn't have a post validation for security, they basically misconfigure the system because bring up teams doesn't responsible for security and for make the screen blinking, sometimes they disable security features. Um, everything goes to the cloud, right? And I would say nowadays actually the virtual machine is equal to ser server because the uptime it's equal and uh, people using the same way as the real servers and same critical data can be stored there. Supply chain is also very difficult on cloud because think about you have your huge data center, then how you basically can update or like make a provisioning all the firmwares when the new server came to the new data center. Some of the vendor does, but many of them not. So it's just became from uh, market and immediately installed to the rack. So, and um, isolated VMs actually can attack too, but some of the scenarios. Um, this picture, I make a classification based on such of attack vectors to create a persistence for the implant on the system. And we have actually two different ways. We have a supply chain misconfigured and we have a result of exploitation. And it's two different paths, but both works and actually can be feasible in the real while. But I want to actually highlight the problem here. Average of the time for patching the vulnerability for the firmware, I count like six, nine months, and it's like the time how long one day vulnerability can be uh, present on the system. And um, six, nine months, actually it's a good timing because sometimes it's even longer and take years. And if you're talking about static memory, it will be forever. <laughs> Challenges of understanding attacker tactics or creating the right mitigations is related to mindset difference between attacker and security architect. And actually, in many cases, um, architect became with a solution when he think he fixing the problem. But the attacker can find some of the way which has not been considered by architect and bypass these mitigations. It's why offensive research actually not equal to security research. Because many cases, security researcher, not a person who been writing the actual exploits in the past, or like proof of concept, or have a deals with vulnerabilities. The problem is like offensive mindset, it's different with usual security research. It's why the mitigation design it's not equal to security architecture. And I think to raise the right points for uh, and feasibility and telemetry for uh, groups who develop the mitigations, it should be exist some group with offensive researchers who basically make a real picture real for the architects. It's actually why <laughs> important to have internal offensive research team and uncover reality. Let's go back to the cloud. And um, this picture actually demonstrate how the privilege go down. And I use almost the same concept as Rob on his previous presentation. So 
let's think about, we have hardware which is, can break everything, right? But if we just focus on the virtual machines and it became our main target and everything is secure, what we will be attacked to make a persistence? Okay, we have a uh, virtual machine introspection with antiviruses and modern security solutions, but we don't have any visibility on the virtual and guest biases. So here is pretty clear, we can attack the BIOS or hardware and basically go up in the stack in many cases, not all of them, to uh, attack the virtual machines. With the firmware, almost the same, but if everything is secure, so we have only virtual BIOS, right? Okay, everything is great if the vendors control it, but in many cases, such as a QVM and QM, or, um, we have a core boot and CBIOS, which is by default not configured securely. And many uh, Linux providers, even some of the very known names, they provide in the same configuration. And what can be wrong, actually? So it's from the real cloud, which is operating with many users, and we can see, basically, we have a flash status register and flash descriptor don't configure it correctly. So it's, does, it's allow us to basically bypass any locks for, uh, for the virtual bias and uh, flash directly over the flash descriptor. So, but bias region write protection also doesn't work correctly with the CBIOS default configuration and a lot of other things. But actually, main point, I was um, sending this information to the vendor of uh, Linux uh, who basically ship uh, not secure configurations for the cloud providers. I say, why you not? It's, they say it's not our fault. We just taken uh, mainstream CBIOS uh, to our machines and contact core boot. Maybe they can fix it. I contact core boot and core boot say, uh, we don't do that because vendors should do that. <laughs> so it's kind of like weak spot for the industry because if you're not the vendor who develop Linux and you know this, or you're not core boot who basically leave these problems on the shoulders of the vendors, so how you can know, right? <laughs> so, but I would say uh, big cloud providers like Amazon, Google, and uh, Azure, they not that bad, of course, and they have a shielded VMs and other solutions to protect uh, uh, integrity of uh, virtual bias uh, working on virtual machine level. But virtual machine bias persistence, it's out of scope of any security solutions. And we don't have any statistics, but we can have clearly see the problems as exist. BMC is the key of the data center, and I will be not maybe focused too much on this part because uh, we know a lot of research past two years was done, and I would actually highlight one from the Airbus because um, this one particularly was super interesting. The attackers did remote exploit on the BMC, then they raise, uh, like elevate the privileges uh, to highest level of the operating system um, on uh, attacked machine, and then operating system of BMC, real-time operating system. But most interesting thing, it was no update process for the BIOS in the web console. But the feature was exist, they found the way how basically updated over exploit with a privilege escalation in real-time operating system. And of course, many BMCs is connected to the BIOS because it's data centers. We need the way how we can update the BIOS in scale for thousands of the machines. Supply chain attacks, 
it's a growing problem, we know that, but how huge it is, and um, the way how hardware is developed is very difficult, right? So many times we have the reference design, which is came stories, or many times the company who develops the hardware doesn't have their own manufacturing process, right? So we should make it, have a deals with the third party factory, which is produce our hardware. And if something goes wrong there, it's really hard and very expensive to fix it, right? So I really like this slide from Andrew Huang uh, presentation from Blue Height Israel last year. Uh, very good uh, to show the complexity of uh, supply chain process. And you can see the link with the full slide deck there. Um, other problem actually being highlighted by uh, Howard Flake and his KNOM, K not because scaling firmware engines is very difficult. And uh, main problem, nobody checked their regions. And specifically for data centers, it can be a critical failure. Why for hardware vendors, security is not of the first place? Actually, hard, in many cases, security is a selling tool. First of all, uh, hardware vendor take care about hardware should work, right? And security is a customer requirement because it should be implemented, we should have TPM, we should have a secure boot, right? All this stuff. But really, in many cases, many companies, not all of them, but many, don't consider it security as a big thing, and they think about more to make, uh, to grow the market. And if the market needs such as a feature, they go and implement it. Also, think about the root of trust. And I think uh, Rob's talk uh, previously already highlighted a lot of problems there, but I would say also as the marketing works, if vendor lock one bit inside the hardware, he would say, I have hardware implemented feature for uh, something. But honestly, yes, it's implemented by hardware, it's locked by hardware, but in many cases, one bit doesn't protect nothing. <clears throat> also, in most of the cases, hardware root of trust is between firmware and lock it fuse. And think about, we have kind of complex boot process in nowadays, and uh, the transition of chain of trust between the steps, it's very complex. And when we verify on the first steps from the fuse, yes, we have root of trust baked on the, inside the hardware, but when we make this transition or goes to the sleep, hibernate, we really verify this chain from scratch? No. We want very fast when the user opens the lid of the laptop, blink the screen, right? And uh, you don't to make user upset waiting for the minutes. Then we somehow cache in root of trust inside the software and it's create a dangerous place for being attacked. I also want to highlight the brilliant idea of Trammell Hudson for race condition vulnerability on the spy flash. And it's really, it's a truth. Authenticated once doesn't mean trusted forever, right? And um, this issue been fixed, but it's a design issue. As I was highlighted before, uh, the DMA attack, which has been fixed, and it's a design issue. Here is the same. It's actually have some very synthetic patch, which is, in many cases, can be bypassed. One of more thing which I want to basically highlight here is ACMs and microcode update process. And actually, also, it's a UFI tool uh, which is uh, show you 
what is covered by uh, boot guard, so by colors. And we clearly can see the boot guard doesn't cover the microcode and uh, ACM. So what that mean? Probably the attacker can easily modify it and boot guard will be not notice at anything. One more problem. We have a blacklist and whitelist for ACMs and microcode, which is doesn't allow you to downgrade ACM in many cases. But if you downgrade both, of course, for specific generation of CPU, it's possible. And uh, such as of discussion with Alex Yermolov we have uh, before, and uh, actually he found the issue particularly like that on machines, uh, which is allow basically bypass hardware root of trust just because of downgrading ACMs. So back to uh, Halvar Flake's keynote, actually, I want to say highlight particularly this. And current approach for firmware security is based in ensuring nobody can get it code signing. If somebody compromise your signing server, you can do nothing with it, right? So it can be shipped to something malicious to your clients. And we have actually third party components as a part of supply chain. In many cases, actually, hardware vendors doesn't control all the firmware across the system and the source code. Think about, we have USB-C, and in many cases, they have a USB-C firmware as a binary blob comes from the third party. Why? Because it's cheaper. For the code access level, you need to pay more. So supply chain attack vectors extend attack surface, which always been out of scope for hardware and firmware vendors. TPM issues will be not stay while here was present last year. So basically it's mix of the software and hardware based attack. So we can do man in the middle if we have a physical access and uh, TPM genie was a very interesting research from Jeremy Boone. But major actually vendors also trying to fix zero to trust with um, particular chips, which is baked at root of trust in the silicon. What are the problems here? In many cases, it's very simple chips. And also, uh, sometimes vendors actually leave some of the problems in supply chain, as Rob highlighted with the Fetian and actually with the Titan chips, which has been there. Uh, and um, also the problem is we have in many cases on these chips, most of the firmware is static. So it's unpatchable and they need to recall, right? So if something happens, also it's simple chips and I would say actually T2 is very interesting and great in many cases, but you never know, right? Any of the hardware vendors doesn't have a full chain supply chain, uh, full, chain full supply chain control, which as I mentioned before, and a lot of third party vendor firmwares came as a binary block. Operation Shadow Hammer, mentioned before, early morning today, compromise update process. And on ASUS stack machines, it's used also to deliver the firmware. So interesting case when the update process being unified for such as a vendor, but it's been compromised, right? So, and it can compromise anything coming from that. I would say researchers arm race it will never stop. And we have a lot of stuff to do here on the industry side, and I think on the research side too, and it will be continue. Thank you very much, and it's a big pleasure for me to present this talk on the industry people today. I will be happy to answer questions.
Hello. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe go into more detail about the uh, virtual machine guest BIOS stuff, because most of the times that I've seen that, it's some stateless blob that you load at boot time from the hypervisor, and there's no persistent state in the uh, guest BIOS level. So, like, if I NVRM vars are just dropped between boots, and so there's it doesn't re- like it doesn't seem to be a useful persistence vector because there's no persistence. So you say great thing. It drops between the boots, but how frequently it basically reboots? It's the main question. And other thing, actually, I want to highlight it here: um, the attacker in such of the cases don't want to persist uh, for like years. He want to persist for collecting some of the data. Also, other thing, he want to bypass antivirus introspection. Main of the thing, and I think actually many of the vendors and Microsoft Hyper V doing the great thing. Also, I like approach which is Google doing with the shielded VMs, but it's also other vendors, smaller clouds don't do this. Actually, this issue was founded on Yandex Cloud, which is very very big provider for the cloud solutions in Russia, and it was actually in the wild so. Anybody can attack it. And even worse, not for Yandex, but for other case, when this BIOS been reused between multiple machines, copied from the same place, and you have access to basically uh, modify it on the file system, you know, then basically you can <laughs> make a bypass of the uh, guest to guest escape very easily through the BIOS. So you raise the good points, but it's not that easy. <laughs> Okay, no questions? Good, thank you very much.